We're back on AD in the morning, and I am, wow, in awe, a little bit of our guest today, Mr. Denny Lane, a quick resume, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, founding member of the Moody Blues, also played in this band called Wings with this, what was that other guy's name? Paul McCartney, I think it was, and quite a solo career, worked with just about everybody in the business. Denny Lane, thanks so much for being with us on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> So you're going to be at the River Music Experience in Davenport on Saturday night, 7 o'clock, uh, for a show or part of a tour that you're doing. It's called Songs and Stories, and obviously I'm sure you've got a few of those. Uh, you, you want to tell us a little bit about the show? Yeah, I'm, I'm keep, try to keep the stories down to a minimum. It, it depends how much I get carried away, because it is a bit of an audience participation thing. You know? Oh, that's awesome. Stuff. Okay. You end up... You end up talking about what they want to talk about. Well, sure. Mainly, my my uh, my side of it is more. I'll write. I'll, if I've written a song with whoever, you know, one of the Moody's or or Paul or people like that, then I will talk about that song and then play the song, and then I'll do the same with, uh, you know, other stuff. You see what I mean? It's more. It's more or less to do with my career. And um, right. Some wing, some Moody blues, and some solo stuff. Well, sure. Uh, some new stuff as well, some new stuff, and people seem to like the new stuff that they've never even heard before. So I, I get a chance to do all of that with a solo show, you know, as opposed to when I go out with my band, which is another thing altogether. So you got a few different band projects going on. You sound like a couple of the DJs we have here at Vintage Radio. Um, you know, it's not just one band. You got, oh, I'm writing this music, I'm doing this, I got this show for myself. I, you know, you, you're staying busy. You yeah, have to. I mean, the other thing is that, you know, it curbs the boredom because you don't want to be just doing one. It's true. You know, when I go out with the band, I do the band on the Run album and the Moody Blues album and a few other songs. And then I've got a trio where I do sort of cross the board stuff, you know, and then I do the solo thing. So that keeps me like from getting bored with the same show all the time and the audience, really. Has boredom been a problem for you throughout your career? Because, uh, I mean, okay. Oh. Real quick here. I wouldn't call it, What's I wouldn't that? Call it boredom. Ah. I wouldn't call it boredom. That's, that's a bad word. But you know, you just get you get to the point where you want to stay fresh all the time, and that keeps you fresh. Is what I'm saying. You see what I mean? Yeah, you know, I do. I, I you're 74 years old, correct? I am. Yeah. And you're still working on staying fresh. Well, absolutely. You, that is you know, awesome. That's what, you that's what drives you forward. Is the the fact that you've still got a lot you want to do, you know, and it's and as I say, I'm enjoying doing these gigs. The, the audiences are getting younger too. There's older and middle age and and young people come to these gigs, so that's encouraging, you know. So you they keep you on your toes, believe me. Oh well, yeah. You know, I'm having a ball. I'm having a ball, really. That's awesome. Having a ball. Seventy four years old, playing in three bands, and you know, just happens to be a legend in rock and roll. Now, of course, you are a rock and roll hall of famer. For your work with the Moody Blues, how did that go about? How did that all come together back in what 1964? Well, yeah, we had a number one hit, and and of course, you know, that's what got us into the Hall of Fame. It took us all these years. The Moody's, as you know, went off and did a whole new career, and you know, a very successful career. And I went off with Wings, but we never expected to go in the Hall of Fame. It's not like we were pushing for it. But a lot of fans used to think we should be, but we never thought twice. We're from England, you know. We don't think much about the Hall of Fame being, the, you know, so significant to English bands. But when we were there and we got inducted, you know, you feel really, like, honored because you're part of this whole big American thing, you know, which I love. Because I spent most of my time in America anyway. And, um, you know, I met all the old Moody's and Justin and John, who I knew a little bit, and... It was a great night, it really was, and, and um, you know, I met all the, you know, the people from other bands, Bon Jovi and Dire Straits, a lot of people that I like and admire who I've met before, some of them. So it was a real great night, it really was. That is awesome. So, Hall of Fame, you know, it is, I guess, it's funny that being from England, you guys just don't, that's just not a big deal to you, but I, I like that about it, you know, I like that you're just like, yeah, you know, cool, uh, we'll be there, you know. Now, how did you form Moody Blues to begin with? I mean, how did you guys get back together back in the 60s? 
Well, I had my own band called the Diplomats, and they didn't want to turn professional. Now, the drummer did, but he was the drummer who went on to be with Jeff Lynne in ELO, so that was Bev Bevan. Wow. He wanted to turn professional, but the other guys didn't. So I was asked by two of the Moody's, who had just come back from Germany, they would saw that, you know, we used to, they used to go out there and play for the American Forces Network in Germany, you know, and um, as the Beatles did. Right. So they came... He wanted to put a band together to go back to Germany. And I said, I would join as long as we just do blues music. You know, I was really like into more blues than just kind of, you know, the hits of the day and stuff like that. So I uh, I joined and then we went to, we got discovered actually in the blues club and we were, we were scooted down to London. And that's where it all started to happen. It happened on the Chuck Berry tour. We'd go now, go to number one on that, and uh, and it went from there. You know, we used to play all the blues clubs though. You know, we played with the Yardbirds and Rod Stewart, Jeff Beck. We played with a lot of people, the Who, wow. and, uh, all all these venues in London where we all kind of started together. You know. And then you know you all kind of gradually moved over this way and just took over music. Well, yeah. that's true. But, I mean, th- thanks to the Beatles. I mean, if they hadn't come. You know, and, and, and Ed Sullivan. And yeah. That's really what it all off. We never we never got on the Ed Sullivan show, unfortunately, because our visa didn't come through in time for the booking that we had. Oh, wow. That would have made a difference. Yeah, that would have made a difference, but we missed out on that one. Jeez. But we did the Brook, Brooklyn Fox for Murray the K and all that stuff. Wow. Now, okay, you, you talked about you got discovered at a blues club. Now, how did that go? Guy just walks up to you and says, hey, let's sign a record contract? Well, it was some a company that had been involved with the Beatles um, uh, marketing stuff. You know, they were, they were a company that made some money out of working with the Beatles and decided they wanted to have their own act. So they came, saw us, and they kind of molded us a little bit, you know, cleaned us up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <to the side. laughs> and, uh, and just kind of molded us and, and got us all the best publicity and all the best gigs and everything like that. Wow. So uh, anyway, but when we, we kind of walked away from them after a while because everybody didn't see much money, so we went with uh, Brian Epstein, who was Beatles manager, of course, and um, that's how we got on the Beatles tour. So the Beatles were great friends of ours in those days, and that's why Paul asked me to join Wings. You know, that's really the short story. You know, he knew me well, so right. So it happened. What, uh, I mean, you have some wild nights back in those days, running around with the Beatles, you know, on tour? Uh, if you want to call them wild, I mean, you know, we, we didn't, you know what, people said it was all wild, but it really was. <laughs> I mean, it was a lot, of, a lot of fun. We were working. You know, the Beatles always say, we only ever had one day off, and so did the Moody's. We, it was work. We, we were very, very much vetted by our management, and, the, you know, you couldn't go around like a lot of the bands after you know, just thought you all had to have a bottle of Jack Daniels and snort a Coke all day long and you'd be cool. But it wasn't like that then. We were just, we were only just experimenting with, you know, very minor marijuana, a bit of hash. We weren't really into drugs and we weren't really into drinking, but that that stigma came later with a lot of the younger bands and, and um, they thought it was worth it. it was. But we were working hard. We were a hard-working band. Um, we never had time for, you know partying that much we did have some parties we had parties at our house we had all everybody in the music business would be at our parties but you know that lasted about two or three days and that'd be it back to work you know that, that was a party two or three days oh yeah people <laughs> coming and going we, yeah we had a big house out in the country and just people would come in and go and sleep over or come in the next day and last about three days in all but it would be everybody in the music business. You can name, you know, Tom Jones, or the Stones, the Beatles, obviously, and, and everybody, just anybody in England who was a name. Really. Wow. Animals. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, I would just have to guess that there was probably some guitars and drums around there, and if we could have only had a video camera in there to record some of the impromptu things that went on. The truth is, not a lot of that went on. But everybody was just kind of sitting down and drinking and talking and, and having fun. It wasn't really a you know, music thing. There might have been a couple of guitars around every now and then, but it wasn't really for that. Huh. It, was, it was a big house and everybody's out in the garden, you know, laughing and joking and, and having a drink. It was 
you know, it was just one of those things, really. And it was really to meet up with everyone. That's the way everybody met. We met in the clubs, too. There was a lot of people in the clubs in the old days, and speakeasy in Scotia St. James. You know, we would we would go to those clubs after. I mean, you know, we went... I did a Jimi Hendrix show, and we all ended up down this club called the Speakeasy. We we met Jimi Hendrix in the... Um, me and Paul went to see Jimi Hendrix at the Bag of Nails. Now, all these places are all owned by the same people, more or less. Right. So yeah, I we, think it's like that today. Part, yeah. Part, yeah, part of the scene there. And we, a lot of American bands came over, too. We, we would go and see Dylan or The Birds or people like that. Wow. What was, uh, what was Jimi Hendrix like? Oh, well, I knew his guys. I knew his band. And, oh. Um, it, was, it was great to me. It was very nice to me. It, especially, I, I closed the show we did with him with my own band called the Electric String Band and and I he was really impressed he loved it because I was doing something progressive he said hey man it was great man you know he was really impressed and uh, gave me a couple of compliments and I had a drink and <laughs> right on <laughs> kind of knew each other a little bit before that you know? that is so cool wow you sir have lived some kind of life I gotta say and we're we're just in the first part here um Moving on now, uh, of course, some things change. 1971, Paul asked you to join Wings, his new band. Uh, and, of course, you're with him through 81. And I'd like to hear how that all kind of shook out. And also, I want to get at some point to Band on the Run, because that's maybe my favorite song of all time. It's definitely in, like, the top three or four. Okay. Well, I got that call from Paul, and it was while my band was off the road. And I... While my band was off the road, because they were string players, they were doing an orchestral tour, some of them. So I ended up doing the little thing with Ginger Baker for a while. Um, you know, his management was Robert Stigwood, who did the Bee Gees, and Eric Clapton, of course. And, and then up in his office one day, Eric walked in, and we all said hello again. I would seen each other for a bit. And, and Robert wanted me to, you know, stick with Ginger, but he got sick. He said, if you want to stay around because we're going to carry this on in a few months' time when Ginger gets better. I said, sure. Anyway, during that time, I got a call from Paul to go up to Scotland. So there you go. But, uh, you know, I, I had, you know, I was, I was straight on the plane, and I had been sitting in the office one day. I was talking to Mark Boland, actually, who's a friend of mine. And um, the phone rang, and Paul says, do you want to get a band together? I said, great, let's do it. And that, that was it. I was on the next plane. Up to his farm in Scotland and wow. jammed for days. And, you know, I knew him. We knew each other really well. So, I mean, we all grew up in the same music. It was really easy. And, and uh, we just played until we got good. You know, I got Henry in, who was a friend of mine from the Joe Cocker band, Henry McCulloch. Yeah. And he already had Danny Sywell. Well, he already had him from the band, from the Ram album. And that was that. So we just developed it. You know, it took a while, but we developed it into a good live band. I would say. Would you? I would say. And I, and I got to assume people were, I wasn't around in 1971. I'm only 41 now. Um, so, but I have to assume people were probably excited about someone from the movie, you know, all the names in that band, obviously you and Paul being the bigger ones, yeah. you know, to be, okay, they're in a band now. We're going to be putting out music. What was that like? I mean, just the kind of the buzz around the band, if you will. Well, there's a lot of pressure on us to be good. I mean, you can't just walk out of bands like the Moody Blues and the Beatles and be like a huge band. I mean, you've got to get to, you know. So we, we did it quietly. We went to universities, played there, and we did a lot of, you know, away from the press stuff. We did a lot you could still stuff. get away from the press back then? Yeah, yeah, we had to be away from the press. We didn't want to be too out, out front. So we, we we worked in Scotland and rehearsed and recorded and did all that sort of thing. But we never, re until we got half good, we never really toured. We, we went and did this university tour, which was under the covers, you know. And um, that started us, gave us the confidence. And, and then we built into playing live in Europe. And uh, that's really all that happened. It was... It was a very organic kind of situation, and then all of a sudden, you know, we, we, we started getting hits and whatever, and then the shows got bigger, and away we went, you know. Oh, 
Now, you're uh, a two-time Grammy winner, and one of them was for Band on the Run in 1974. I think the song actually came out in 73. What, uh, I love the song. What was the inspiration behind that, and, you know, how much, how much of that is you in there? Well, it's Paul's song, Band on the Run. It's just that we... We worked together on an arrangement, and it was kind of three different bits that he had, and we kind of I helped him put them together. We actually rehearsed it with with the band, the, that band to start with, but they did they decided they didn't want to come to Lagos, Nigeria, to record. So we went on our own, and just me and Paul did the music, you know. So we already knew the arrangements, and and I helped him a lot with the arrangements and stuff like that. Cause we we kind of bounced off each other. You know, I wrote a couple of things, but, but Band on the Run itself was his song. And, and as I say, he played drums on the album. We just kind of, I play guitar, and then we added stuff to it. And people like it for some reason. It's got a special feel about it. So. Yeah, it's the darndest thing. <laughs> yeah. You're, it, it amazes me, and just so refreshing, how humble you are. I mean, you're like well, a big-time rock star, man. You're a legend, and you're just like, ah, oh, you know, we're just hanging out. You know, it's it's all good. Just, just so, uh, you know, as cool as the other side of the pillow, if you will. And and I just love it. That is well, awesome. Well, we all started out from nothing, you know. So I mean, what are you gonna do? That's what you you all you come from like working-class backgrounds, and you make it, and you do well. You're still the same person underneath. That's the way it is, and and I've I've been through the ups and downs of this, and it's never been an option to do anything else for a living. So I mean, that's just what I do, and it's like it's not like a job, but it's you, you get so used to it all the time that you know you just you, you're cool with it, you're you're relaxed with it, you know. There's no yeah. pressure on, on. The older you get, the better it gets, actually. Really. But, uh, but, you know, again, you've still got to go out there and give them something they want to hear, you know. I mean, that's the way it is. And I'm in that fortunate position. I can go out and play all these songs uh, and still have my chops together to a certain degree that, that they, that the audience, is, you know, love it. So I'm happy. I'm sure they do. And, uh, again, now we're talking to Denny Lane, uh, one of the founding members of the Booty Blues, Wings, Ginger Baker's Air Force, a uh, ton of solo stuff. And he's going to be doing songs and stories at the River Music Experience in Davenport, Saturday night, 7 o'clock. And you said now the audience kind of dictates things. Now, do you drink at all? No. No. I so mean, uh, so no one's going to feed uh, you a bunch of drinks and get you telling bad stories or anything. Uh, 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 I do tell a couple of stories about how John Lennon invented Scotch and Coke. And I once in a while, you know, do have a... A glass of wine, but I kind of packed in drinking, but not you know hundred percent. But yeah, I got gotcha. you. You're you're it's mellow now. I understand. I'm just giving you a hard time. You know, people buy you some drinks to try and get you talking. But you said now, if so, if somebody wants to ask you a specific question about someone or something, then you're probably going to try and answer it. True, but, but again, like if I told the story about John Lennon inventing Scotch and Coke when we we're all sitting around a big table, somebody will send a Scotch and Coke to the stage. You know, I, mean, <laughs> I don't. Think what was Lennon like? You know, you spent a lot of time around him, too. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. Well, I went out a few times with John. Um, it, yeah, it was, a, it was a laugh, John. He was a good laugh. He wasn't really a serious, that serious. He was, but he got, he got taken seriously by a lot of people because he was so outspoken. But at the same time, he was just being himself. But it was a good laugh. He, you know, we had a great time hanging around with the Beatles, really. It was all fun. He seemed like kind of a smart aleck, you know, but in a humorous way. Just from, yeah, exactly. you know, things that I've seen and clips and this and that, you know, kind of, he had a good sense of humor about him for sure. That's, uh. Yeah. Well, he wanted to answer people's questions. He could have just ignored, you know, and said, I'm not talking about anybody. But he, at least he cared enough to try and answer questions. But you, you can't help but make fun of some of those questions. Come on, I mean, you know. Like so, you get into that. They get into that habit of just, just making fun of everything. What are you going to do? You know, I mean, at the same time, you're still getting your point across. You know, but, but unfortunately, a lot of people took him too seriously, and that's why he's not with us today. You know, there's, there's those fanatics out there that just thought he was a different guy. You know, but he was a very dad to us guy. There's no airs and graces about John. Huh. Wow. Denny Lane, you're blowing my mind here. Um, I, I think we only got here for a couple more minutes. Uh, I, I'm just, 
I, I'm just kind of in awe here. I apologize. I uh, usually have it together a little better, but you're just, this is just amazing stuff you're talking about. I like in awe. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, huh? I mean, yeah. It's just, it's just, it's just my life, really. So, in, in, to me, you know, I've known a lot of people who became famous, and that, that's all there is to it. To me, they're just friends. Some of them, unfortunately, are not with us anymore, you know. I had a lot of great friends pass away. But, uh, you know, musicians, drummers, or whatever, just musicians, singers, you name it. But, you know, to me, it's just like part of the whole story. And um, and I can, um, I have some good good and bad memories of, of, of all of that, you know. So sure. It's all good. That's life, you know. But it's, yeah. you ever just sit down and think, wow, I'm Danny Lane. Cause Not really. No, you yeah, just I mean, I'm so know, humble. Somebody, no, people want me to do books and stuff, and I keep saying, well, I tried it once, and it was a lot of work, and still haven't got around to it. But, you know, when you got to sit down and bring all those memories back and, talk, and deal with that, well, we'll see, you know. But again, you know, I'd rather just move forward. That's the way it is, and that's what I'm doing. That is awesome. Well, everybody, go see Denny Lane. He'll sing songs. He'll tell some stories. Uh, I think it'll be one hell of a good time. River Music Experience this Saturday, 7 o'clock in Davenport. Denny, I can't thank you enough for your time. I would love, absolutely love to do this again sometime with you. Uh, maybe another, you know, next tour round or any t- time, really. Okay, sounds good to me. Thank you. I enjoyed it. All right. Well, we look forward to seeing you Saturday night. Thanks, Denny. Oh, cool, man. Thanks.